Welcome everybody who's signing on. We'll give it just a minute here. All right, it is seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to this University of Missouri St. Louis speaker series event from UMSL Global. My name is Evie Hemphill. I'm, I'm a producer with St. Louis on the Air, the noon talk show at St. Louis Public Radio. Um, and this is our region's NPR member station. St. Louis Public Radio is also a part of UMSL and we're a public service of the university. And I'm so glad to be part of the university community and of tonight's event. This marks the third in a series of presentations that are part of this year's Dr. Edwin Fetter Lecture on Foreign and International Affairs. Dr. Fetter was the founder of UMSL's international office about 50 years ago, now called UMSL Global. And this lecture series honors his legacy, seeking to carry on his pattern of bringing good information about the world to the UMSL community and beyond. And now I'm pleased to introduce a couple of special guests with us tonight. First, we have with us here, Liana Constantine. She is the executive director of UMSL Global. Hi, Liana. And we also have with us tonight's speaker, Paul Costigan. Paul is the Missouri State Refugee Coordinator for the International Institute of St. Louis. He has worked at the Institute since 1999. And in addition to serving as the Missouri State Refugee Coordinator, overseeing refugee programs across the state, Paul is also the Senior Vice President of Operations for the International Institute. Before these roles, he oversaw the Institute's employment program. And before that, he served in the Peace Corps in Slovakia. I do wanna give a quick reminder before we get started tonight that we'll be saving some time for audience questions using that Q&A tool that we talk about following the presentation. So you can feel free to pass along questions as you think of them, and we'll try to get to lots of those following Paul's talk. Um, and please do use that Q&A tool, not the chat box, um, so that we can get to as many of those questions as we can. And now without further ado, I am pleased to turn things over to Paul Costigan for his presentation. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Evie. Uh, again, uh, my name is Paul Costigan and I am currently the Missouri State Refugee Coordinator. Um, have been in that role since 2018. Um, the role really is one of oversight and administration of the state's refugee program. And I'll get a little bit more into that um, as we as we kind of delve into the slides, kind of what our structure is um, and what our um, what our marching orders are as far as the, the statewide refugee resettlement program. But um, as Evie said, uh, the office that uh, that I run, the Missouri Office of Refugee Administration, is a um, is an arm of uh, it's a it's an independent office. I should say, within the International Institute of St. Louis. Um, and of course, the International Institute of St. Louis has been um, a uh, cornerstone of our St. Louis community since its founding back in 1919, so well over 100 years old at this point. Um, but uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the current um, situation in St. Louis and a little bit about the current situation in Missouri of, uh, of Afghan uh, resettlement. It's been um, in the news quite a bit um, over, uh, over the last few months um, since the fall of, uh, of Kabul to, uh, to the Taliban. And uh, since, since then, there, has, there have been um, uh, numerous um, uh, families that have arrived into St. Louis as part of that evacuation uh, from Afghanistan. So I will get started. Um, wanted to give you a quick, uh, brief history of the, of the um, refugee resettlement program. Um, although we uh, at the International Institute were resettling refugees um, prior to 1980, uh, really the modern uh, United States refugee program uh, started in 1980 with the passage of the United States Refugee Act. Um, and that codified uh, a lot of um, the, uh, the, 
the, the system that, that the United States um, uses for, for refugee resettlement. Um, it, it, um, for example, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is a federal um, office within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, was started due to the, the Refugee Act of, of 1980. Um, the, um, prior to 2018, the Missouri, office, uh, Missouri Department of Social Services um, was the administrator of the, of the refugee resettlement program. That's very typical for, um, for states to have the, the refugee, re, uh, refugee resettlement program within a state government structure. There are, however, a few um, states that have decided to um, leave the, the administration of the refugee resettlement program. Um, uh, 13 to 14, I would say at this point in Missouri is one of them. And so at that point, the, um, the, um, the administration of the state refugee program gets transferred over to uh, a nonprofit. In our case, it was transferred over to the International Institute of St. Louis, which was um, at that time and still is the largest refugee resettlement agency um, within the state. So as of 2018, I became the, um, the state refugee coordinator as the, the administration of the program uh, was moved from, from the state structure to the International Institute to the nonprofit structure. Um, and one of the first things I had to do was create an independent office within the International Institute. Um, and we called that the Missouri Office of Refugee Administration. Um, and um, um, I do have a, uh, a, a small but, but mighty staff working with me um, within that department to administer all of the, the refugee programs that we administer across the state. Um, a little bit about uh, what, what constitutes a refugee. Um, and uh, this is kind of general background information for, for everyone. But um, um, according to the um, uh, UNHCR, the United Na uh, Nations High Commission for Refugees, um, the, a refugee is determined, uh, is characterized as having fled um, their country due to war or persecution. Um, one of the things that is very typical of a refugee is the, um, the idea that they will eventually return back home after, after you know, the, the situation in their home country um, settles down. Um, most refugees who are in refugee camps uh, across the world um, do are, are there and, and, and think that they're not going to stay in the refugee camp forever and they're not going to be uh, transferred to another country, but that they will actually um, return home after um, uh, a government changes or, um, or, or the military is deposed or, or something like that. Um, to gain refugee status, a person uh, must be outside their country of origin. So that means that um, they, they um, for the official refugee status, they have to be outside of their, of their own country. Um, typical example uh, um, would be um, Somalis um, who find themselves in refugee camps in neighboring countries, for example, in Kenya. Um, uh, there are several um, rather large refugee camps right on the border between um, Kenya and Somalia, but on the on the Kenyan side, and those Somalis are are deemed refugees because they are outside of Somalia and they are in Kenya. Um, they are granted status um, if they can prove a well-founded fear of persecution according to these characteristics. Um, the fear of persecution uh, due to race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. And those are, those are cornerstones of the United Nations uh, refugee program. Um, and will, a person will only be granted refugee status if they can prove um, persecution based on one or more of those categories. Um, those are longstanding categories as well. So they've been around for, uh, for a number of years. Um, and then uh, UNHCR, uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees, grants refugee status in that country of asylum. So, you know, when that when the case I just mentioned, the the, um, the Somalis are in are in Kenya, 
that, that is where they are granted refu refugee status outside of their, of their home country. And this is a little bit different than, um, than uh, the situation with the Afghans, and I will get into that in, in just a second too, but this is just a little bit of, of, uh, of background for everyone. Um, the International Institute, which I said has uh, got started in 1919, um, predominantly to serve um, uh, war brides of World War I soldiers who are coming back to the United States um, uh, after World War I, of course. Um, and uh, a number of international institutes were created back in 1919 um, uh, to, to serve that purpose. Um, to provide uh, English classes to, to these war brides and to um, provide them socialization with others. Um, um, and so um, that's, that's kind of how the International Institute movement uh, got started. Um, the International Institute has a number of uh, programs, um, uh, nationally known programs, I should say, um, um, that, uh, that serve the, the foreign born community in, uh, in St. Louis. Um, some of those are uh, listed here, a couple of them English classes, which are very important for, um, for, uh, for refugees, uh, especially at the very beginning, uh, to get a grasp of English so that they can, they can uh, function in our communities. Um, they do cultural orientation, computer training, uh, job placement and training, which is also very important um, because that is really um, essentially the sole means of, of financial, of providing financially to, uh, to someone's family. Um, they, we have uh, citizenship programs that, that help uh, people um, uh, study for and prepare for both the citizenship exam and for the um, and for the, the the live interview that has to take place before citizenship, it's a very uh, very popular program and a very important one, um, predominantly because um, um, after a, uh, a refugee turns sixty five, um, they only have a, sh a very short period of time uh, to collect um, social security, which they've been paying into while, while they were working, if they haven't become citizens. So, um, so it's very key, especially for elderly, um, elderly refugees and immigrants um, who are eligible for citizenship to become citizens so that they can continue to, um, uh, to um, access uh, benefits such as Social Security. Um, obviously, refugee resettlement is a big one. Um, that is kind of the engine that drives the, the, the train of the International Institute, something that the Institute is, is um, most known for. Um, uh, some people that go back a little bit uh, farther uh, remember the, um, uh, the Bosnian resettlement of um, the 1990s um, and early 2000s. Um, but there have been several waves of, of refugee uh, refugee groups that have come in. Before the Bosnians, it was the Cubans, and before the Cubans, it was the Haitians, um, and before the Haitians, it was the Vietnamese. And so you always have kind of these, these groups of, uh, of, of folks coming in, and that's when the, the refugee resettlement uh, program kicks in and all of the services that are provided through, um, through that uh, resettlement program. Um, one of the other important ones, too, that I want to point out is, is the uh, business development. Um, um, oftentimes, uh, refugees come with a desire to, um, to, be, their own, to be their own boss, to, to start their own business. Um, they might have a good idea from their home country, or they might have uh, an idea that they've learned here, um, and that they want to, um, uh, they want to put in place um, a, uh, a successful small business. And we, in the we at the International Institute help them along that path, provides um, uh, access to microloans, um, provide financial training, um, uh, business planning, and that kind of thing. So that is an important economic resource that I think the, um, the St. Louis region has. Um, and uh, and uh, um, we like to see all of our, all of the small businesses that have been created through um, through the, the, um, 
the small business program be successful and be long term uh, and grow actually um, so that they can actually hire other people, not just people from their own ethnicity, but um, people from all across the region uh, into, into those positions. And last, but definitely not least, is, is one of my favorites, um, is the Festival of Nations. Um, uh, and that is a, um, uh, well, other than the last two years during the pandemic has been one of the big events uh, in, in St. Louis during the summertime. It's always the last weekend in, in August. And, um, and showcases really the diversity um, of, uh, of our, our population in St. Louis. Um, everyone uh, probably that's been to the festival probably knows all about the, the food offerings, but there really are, are other really great cultural, uh, cultural events that happen during that weekend. You know, the dancing and the music and the crafts and the children's areas. Um, and uh, and um, although I can't promise, I'm really pretty positive that we'll be back in 2022 during that last weekend in August, and then back in um, back in Forest Park, uh, beautiful or Forest Park in Tower Grove Park, uh, nice shady Tower Grove Park where uh, where that festival belongs. So, so a little bit about our structure because. Um, um, as the um, Missouri Office of Refugee Administration is part of the International Institute, we have to stay separate from the, from the Institute because they are one of our subcontractors. We provide them federal funds um, to operate their, um, their resettlement, uh, resettlement programs. So um, currently there are, um, there are uh, subcontractors that provide re uh, refugee programs in four locations. Uh, there are two agencies actually in Kansas City. Um, and there's actually even a third one on the Kansas side of Kansas City. So within the Kansas City metropolitan area, there are actually three refugee resettlement agencies, two of which are on, on the Missouri side and two of which we uh, subcontract um, with to, uh, to provide refugee programming. There's a smaller office in, in Springfield um, a Catholic Charities Office in Columbia that does resettlement, and of course, in St. Louis, the, uh, the International Institute. Uh, we also subcontract with the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, we uh, run a program that is called uh, Refugee School Impact, which provides funds for uh, local school districts that are, that are highly impacted by, uh, by uh, volume of, of uh, refugee youth in their in their schools. So um, we have um, we have that program that um, that the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education then um, uh, sends to to school districts around the state um, to provide uh, provide those school districts with with funds to get um, uh, learning materials and to fund ESOL instructors and, and things like that. Um, also, another um, subcontractor is um, uh, an organization called RAISE, which is in Knoll, Missouri. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of Knoll, Missouri, but it is in the very far southwest corner of Missouri, really essentially on the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. Um, and yes, there are refugees there that we need to, uh, that, that we um, provide RAISE funding to, to serve. Um, so, um, so you can see there's a really a cross section of, of uh, areas around the state that, um, that provide refugee services. Um, some of the programs that, uh, that I mentioned, well, I mentioned uh, Refugee School Impact, which is on this list, but some other ones, uh, Refugee Cash Assistance, we're able to provide eight months of uh, small amounts of cash assistance to uh, newly arriving refugees. Um, also, there's a medical assistance program to provide them uh, with uh, medical insurance if they do not qualify for Medicaid. Um, uh, there's uh, refugee social services, which is an employment program, services to older refugees. I mentioned a little bit about the, that citizenship program, but they also help with um, health care and um, um, and independent living so that uh, so that folks can stay in their own um, uh, their own homes for as long as possible. 
We have a, a youth mentoring program, which is a great program that matches up uh, refugee youth between 16 and 24 with um, not necessarily native born, but um, that is, is um, some of the people that have that are mentees are, are, are native born to provide uh, youth with information on, you know, uh, uh, high school and finishing high school and going to college and career exploration, all kinds of things that um, that a mentee uh, can can instill, you know, knowledge that a mentee can instill knowledge on on some of our refugee youth. Um, and finally, there's the a refugee temporary assistance connection. That is a program that um, is uh, essentially um, trying to move people off of. Um, of uh, government assistance uh, like TANF uh, into, uh, into being more independent uh, through employment. So um, our um, statewide refugee arrivals numbers have fluctuated quite a bit. You'll see by this chart. Um, um, in um, 2016, we had a very robust year. That was uh, a year when we were resettling quite a few Syrians um, during the, the, the um, crisis there. Um, and then you can see kind of a steady fall off between 2017, 2018, uh, 2020, and then 2021. Um, the 2021 um, uh, fall off was um, predominantly due to, um, to COVID, as was really 2020. Um, um, so there were uh, far fewer uh, refugees coming into our communities um, uh, in the state um, in, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and in uh, 2022, the anticipated number of refugee arrivals is uh, 2,305. That's across the entire state of Missouri. If you add in the um, Afghan parolees, who we're going to talk about in just a second, um, that number jumps to uh, 3830. Um, so we have, we're expecting 1,525 parolees to come into the state uh, over the next uh, month or two. Um, the um, asterisk down at the bottom is, um, I know some people are disturbed by the, by the term parolee, but it is just really a temporary designation given to um, a group of people who are allowed to come and stay into the United States for a short period of time. Um, generally, uh, humanitarian parolees are granted that status so that they're not forced to go back to a situation where, um, where their lives would be in, in, in jeopardy. Um, but um, for these Afghan parolees, there is a, um, they, they are allowed to stay in the United States um, uh, under parole status for two years. Um, and it will be uh, um, important for us as, as an agency and as a state to, um, to, uh, re, um, to redo their, their official status to that, of an, uh, that, uh, to that of an asylee so that they can stay uh, in the United States permanently and won't be forced back into, um, into a situation which is unsafe. Um, for the International Institute, the arrival numbers look like this, kind of the same pattern for, you know, large number of arrivals in 2016. Um, uh, 1158 was the number that was resettled, um, predominantly, but not uh, exclusively uh, Syrians. Um, and then you have your fall off uh, numbers there. Um, you can see in, in uh, the year 2020, there was only 133 refugees uh, that were resettled. Um, and um, so, and then now in 2022, um, which actually we, we've already started in 2022 because the federal fiscal year, that's the FY, um, starts in October. So these, these numbers have already started, we've already started counting the fiscal year numbers as of October 1st. Um, so the International Institute expects to, um, to resettle um, 1,050 refugees and when you add in the parolees, the 500 parolees that they expect to resettle um, between uh, November and January, um, that's another 500 that it comes out to, to 1,550. That's quite a large number 
Um, if you if you compare it to to prior years, um, you'd have to go back to um, to the Bosnian resettlement um, uh, years back in the in the late '90s and early 2000s to find uh, a number that that large again. Um, um, so it is uh, it's it's uh, a large number, but but the International Institute, along with its partners, are ready to to resettle um, to resettle those. And if I can just point out too that you know this um, 1,050, if you compare to the number of refugees and internally displaced people across the globe that exist, which is about 65 million people, it's a very very small number of of people of those folks uh, who will actually get resettled. Um, the, the, the presidential determination, um, so the president uh, sets the, the upper limit for the number of refugees that can come in uh, over the course of a year. Traditionally, that has been uh, about 70,000, um, and that goes back to, you know, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and, 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 uh, and, and those administrations. Um, but um, as of uh, 2022, um, President Biden has set the uh, the ceiling for refugee arrivals at 125,000. So, um, no more than 125,000 refugees will be admitted um, into the United States in, in uh, fiscal year 2022. And we will um, just between uh, you and me, we will not get to that number of 125,000. Uh, predominantly because this uh, Afghan number is, is taking up a lot of uh, the, the capacity for the United States to do um, additional refugee resettlement. So I don't know how many refugees we'll get in 2022, um, either in, in, in St. Louis or in the United States or in the state of Missouri, uh, for sure. We won't know until the end of the year, but um, my guess would be that there's probably going to be 50,000, 60,000 refugees coming into the United States um, over the next year. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit up about um, Operation Allies Welcome. Uh, this is the, the federal program um, that was set up um, uh, due to the uh, evacuation of, of uh, Afghans out of, um, out of Kabul. Um, so you can see this is pretty uh, text heavy slide. I'm sorry about that, but um, in uh, July 2021, the president uh, launched uh, Operation uh, Allies Refuge um, to, uh, to give people um, a safe space within the confines of the um, uh, Kabul airport um, so that they weren't uh, being going to be persecuted, especially the, uh, um, particularly, I guess I should say, uh, the folks who were, um, who had assisted the United States military over the uh, the last 20 years um, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, the um, Operation Allies Refuge then became Operation Allies Welcome when we started to bring in um, uh, Afghans out of, of Afghanistan into um, secondary um, uh, military bases abroad first, and then, um, and then to uh, US military bases in the United States. So um, initially, people were brought into Fort Lee, Virginia, um, as, um, as special immigrant visas. Those were people who were able to um, provide um, proof that they had worked for the United States military for um, at least one year. Um, and it's not just the military. It could have been uh, the, uh, the United States government as a, as a contractor or something like that, or worked for um, uh, uh, U.S. government agencies such as um, USAID uh, or, or had some affiliation with, uh, with the United States government or with the uh, United States military during their uh, time in Afghanistan. Um, so then due to the urgency of the, of the humanitarian evacuations um, in Kabul, um, um, non-governmental organizations and U.S. government uh, 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 offices established operations to process Afghans overseas, um, predominantly in, um, in Doha, in Qatar. Um, that's where they were flown out originally from, uh, from Afghanistan, had a, a secondary um, stopover in, in Qatar, which um, uh, provided 
uh, the United States government ability to um, do security screenings and, and vet the people who um, made it out of Afghanistan. And then they were provided parole status um, and, um, and uh, flown into the United States. Um, when they were flown into the United States, they came through uh, um, Washington, uh, Dulles, and through Philadelphia, and then were transferred to a US military base, base which was called a safe haven. And so um, these were, um, uh, they're listed here. Um, closest one to us would be Fort Atterbury in Indiana, um, but they were uh, bases uh, all over the United States. Some bases actually reached um, high levels of, um, of Afghans uh, of around 10 to 12,000 people. So these bases were very full of Afghans after they were brought over from um, from those overseas military bases. Um, and um, they uh, remained at those, uh, at those uh, military bases for a minimum of 30 days uh, and were provided um, um, uh, health screenings, immunizations for, um, for you know, all kinds of childhood diseases, polio, that kind of thing, um, so that they had, had gotten a full set of immunizations before they were um, uh, then moved over to, um, uh, to local communities such as St. Louis. Um, in, um, so the number of Afghans who were um, evacuated uh, by the United States government as of uh, November 5th, so um, the latest numbers I'd had was um, at that point, there were still 55,000 uh, folks uh, residing at the safe havens. Those are the United States military bases. And th at that point, still, there were 10,000 people at the lily pads. Those were the overseas military bases um, in, uh, like I mentioned, in Qatar, in uh, Germany, in Italy, and the United Kingdom. So those were the, 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 the jumping off points before uh, moving uh, Afghans over into um, uh, uh, into the onto the United States uh, onto the United States bases. So um, once they're on the U.S. bases, then they have to get additionally sent one more time to um, local communities, um, and that's where the resettlement happens um, through, in our case, through the International Institute of St. Louis. Um, uh, the U.S. government anticipated moving about 3,900 people um, from uh, the, the United States safe havens, those are the U.S. military bases, each week um, once they were cleared for travel by the U.S. government. So that they had gotten their um, biometrics done, um, that they had gotten medical clearance, um, that they had applied for um, an employment authorization document, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> the um, deciding how many people came to each um, location was decided through um, the Department of State. They have an office um, called the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, or PRM. So PRM uh, solicited from all local resettlement agencies across the country, that's um, 208 refugee resettlement agencies across the country, how many um, how many Afghan refugees could they con uh, conceivably resettle between October and March um, of next year? Um, the International Institute decided uh, originally that they could do 300, but then subsequently decided that they could do uh, even more than, than that 300. And that same question was posed to, um, to refugee resettlement agencies um, all across the country. Um, and so um, uh, some decided that they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the staffing or they didn't have the housing capabilities or they didn't have the community supports um, to, to handle such a large number in, over a short period of time. Uh, but the International Institute uh, stepped up and said that they would, um, they would uh, accept 500, which is actually a, a very large number for, for a short period of time. Um, the uh, APA capacity, the APA is the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program. That is what the, the local, the resettlement into local communities 
um, had been called. Um, the capacity has always been a moving target. Um, so when the um, <clears throat> when all of the uh, the refugee agencies were surveyed about their actual capacity um, all across the country. When you added those numbers up, it came out to 54,000. Um, but on the military bases and overseas, there was over 70,000 Afghans. So the capacity of the local agencies to resettle was smaller than the number of actual Afghans who needed resettlement. So uh, PRM, um, has been going back to the agencies again and again, saying, can you do, can you take any more families than you uh, originally had capacity for? When we add up all of the numbers of, uh, of uh, resettlement for, um, uh, from, from all of the agencies in, in Missouri, we come up to that um, 1,525. Um, St. Louis um, capped their capacity to resettle Afghans at 500. <coughs> Um, the bulk of these arrivals of, of those 1525 or that 500 um, are, are actually going to be happening between um, now, actually it started at the beginning of, of November and the end of December. Um, the Department of State has requested that all of those military bases be cleared by February 15th of 2022. So they are in a hurry to get their military bases back and to move uh, Afghan families um, into, into local communities. Uh, some of the numbers that I just pulled um, as of last week, um, um, there were, um, the state of Missouri has accepted 741 Afghans um, all across the state. Um, and we are still waiting for 756. Um, to, um, to move from the bases into, into our local communities in St. Louis, Kansas City, Springfield, and Columbia. Um, for St. Louis, um, 225 had arrived as of um, last week, and, there were, and they were still waiting for another 279 that were still on the base. <clears throat> so you can see this number is a little bit over 500. That's, that's one of the sneaky ways, I think, that the State Department tries to up people's, uh, people's numbers um, because they still need to have um, more capacity than, um, than the agencies have, have actually projected. Um, on one single day, um, in, uh, on the 16th of, um, 16th of November, we actually had eight families arrive. Um, to, and those are flown into the airport. We have to go pick them up at the airport. Um, and uh, a total of 39 people, um, including case, large cases of six, seven, and nine. Um, cases of eight, nine, 11 are not uncommon. Um, very large families are, um, are kind of the norm for, um, uh, uh, for these Afghan families. Um, where they're located are the, the capacity placement numbers uh, just across the, 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 um, the state. Um, mentioned these before. St. Louis um, had placed their capacity at 500, Columbia at 300, Kansas City, which again has two agencies, um, uh, are splitting um, 625 between them. And then Springfield and Joplin are going to um, resettle uh, 100. So some of the mandated services for Afghan parolees um, uh, um, within the first 90 days, um, these are federal government requirements for, um, for service provision, um, is to pick people up at the airport. We don't want them, we want them to be uh, arriving at the airport and nobody's there to meet them. Um, we have to put them into initial housing. Um, the way that the Institute is doing that now is putting them into short-term housing. Um, and then while they're in short-term housing, they're trying to find them long-term housing. But as you can imagine, if you have a family of nine or a family of 11, finding that, that, that permanent housing um, is, is gonna take quite a bit of time uh, because they're, 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 uh, uh, the, their access to funds to pay for that housing is, is quite limited. Um, and um, families receive 
um, $1,225 per person in total financial support. So that is uh, it's a federal government amount that is awarded to, uh, to um, each member of the family. Um, the International Institute and other um, resettlement agencies across the state and across the country um, utilize those funds to help pay for uh, rent and for utilities and for groceries and those kind of things, those expenses um, that, um, um, that uh, the, those, those families incur. Um, they provide them food, clothing, and other essentials. Uh, they provide them case management assistance, so do an intake, um, try to find out what their, um, what their background is, what kind of uh, health conditions they have, and that kind of thing. Um, they provide grocery and bus orientation, meaning they take um, them to the to a grocery store to show them where things are. Um, they also take them on buses so that they can see how to get from one place to another. And finally, another service is um, job readiness classes. So, um, so they can, uh, at a very early stage, get people to be thinking about um, employment. Um, and then you have the ongoing services. Uh, for example, um, um, again, the short-term and permanent housing, um, providing for basic necessities, things for, for apartments and things like that, um, health and mental health. Uh, we are going to have, um, uh, we're going to see with the Afghan population that there is going to be um, a substantial amount of uh, post-migration trauma. Um, that they were being forced out of their uh, the place that they were living and into a new and unfamiliar place. And that is going to cause quite a bit of uh, anxiety and depression and, uh, and, and things like that. So, you know, knowing that we are, we are getting prepared for, um, for that eventuality. Legal assistance, as I mentioned early on, that they're going to have to transition from that parolee status to, um, to an asylee status, which will allow them to stay more permanently, um, and providing them with access to education, their children and adults, um, language access and support, um, cultural connections, <coughs> so they have access to um, places of worship and things like that, things that they would be um, accustomed to, um, uh, providing them with, um, uh, with uh, training so um, so that they can get into uh, into jobs and keep those jobs, and then of course um, providing them with uh, transportation. So those are kind of the ongoing things. Um, some of the population trends um, that we uh, see are um, that the the families are very large. I've mentioned that before. Um, the average size is about five point five people. Um, and they're also multi-generational and kinship care families. So you have um, people care, you know, an aunt caring for a nephew and things like that. Um, and everybody, anybody that remembers kind of those harrowing scenes from, um, from the airport of people pushing their, their kids over the fence um, into the airports, um, we'll, we'll see why there is um, these, these kinship care families because some people couldn't get through Others could get, you know, other family members through, so those had to be uh, matched up. Some of the medical issues that we're finding um, already, and this was already on the base, um, is um, issues of malnutrition, dehydration, uh, skin issues, uh, diabetes and hypertension was, um, is something we're going to be looking at. Um, Follow-up for um, oncology and neurology, orthopedics, um, and then um, this is, is, was very typical. We've had lots of, of pregnant women. Um, we've had um, a lot of miscarriages, unfortunately, even on the cargo planes that were flying people out from, from, uh, 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 from Kabul to, to Doha. Um, but we've also had uh, people already delivering babies um, in the United States. Um, and, uh, and so trying to get them care for uh, um, a prenatal care and postnatal care is, is, is quite important. And then there's dental issues of, of teeth and, and poor oral health um, that we're going to, um, uh, to match folks up with, with, the, proper, uh, with the proper medical care. 
Uh, I talked a little bit about the forced migration trauma, um, and that is especially going to be true with children who didn't uh, may not have understood why they were fleeing um, and um, having to leave, you know, grandparents or parents behind and friends behind and schoolmates behind and things like that. Um, so we're um, we're getting ready for that too, and um, and also that there are um, with quite a few unaccompanied children um, that ha had made it out. Um, uh, unaccompanied children would be under the age of 18 that did not have a parent or brother, sister or guardian, for example. Um, as of uh, September 2021, when the vast majority of people were on the U.S. military bases, they had counted 200 um, unaccompanied children um, uh, as part of that um, uh, that large group of people who that 55,000 who were on military basis at that time. There are uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, has programs to to um, to work with unaccompanied children. There are, several states have unaccompanied refugee minor programs. Uh, Missouri is not one of those. Um, so uh, those 200 will probably end up in in those in those programs and be linked to. Um, to sponsors in, um, in, in various cities um, in those states that have the, uh, um, the, that URM program. Um, and then community support, I want to talk a little bit uh, quickly. I know I'm already um, uh, going a little bit over um, the, the time that I thought I would spend, but um, this, I love this picture. This is a picture that um, the city of St. Louis put in the St. Louis airport very early on in the, um, in, in the, in the refugee process. It says, welcome to St. Louis. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see um, kind of an outline of the Afghan flag. And then on the right-hand side, obviously, is our own um, city of St. Louis flag. And under that is the uh, welcome to St. Louis that is written in both Dari and Pashto, which are the uh, predominant languages of the Afghans that are coming over. So just right when they come into to our city, they get this they get this welcome sign that is. Um, uh, I think I think it's a it, it's a great thing, and um, and I actually shared this with our national partners um, to, so that they could see you know how St. Louis um, uh, really came out swinging in support of. Uh, of, um, of our new Afghan neighbors. So um, a community support, um, um, we had a large donation drives back in August and September. Um, um, actually so much so that we had to um, ask that no more donations be delivered because we did not have families yet and our, the, the gymnasium that we stored everything was full. Um, but we got great numbers of volunteers in there that helped us sort. Um, and so all of those donations that came in are, gonna, are going to families um, as they move into uh, their new apartments. Um, other ways that, that, that community members are showing support is volunteering. Um, we need a, a, a great number of volunteers um, to help us with this process. We don't have enough staff to um, uh, to. to um, to do this resettlement uh, just on our own. Um, and so volunteers are a key component to making this uh, successful resettlement process. Um, anybody that is a supporter can refer any available housing uh, to the International Institute or to a &B, Airbnb Foundation. They have set aside a whole website that is just dedicated to, um, uh, to Afghan arrivals. Um, and people can put up a, uh, an, you know, an empty apartment or something like that um, and make available to Airbnb.org. Um, um, Airbnb does this um, uh, not just for, for um, Afghan refugees. They have done it for um, situations uh, for hurricanes in Louisiana and things like that. It's not new for them, but, um, but it is, it's a great service um, that, um, that, that they're doing to help uh, people find temporary housing uh, for 30 days while the agencies look for more permanent housing. Um, uh, we have a great com uh, community spot, uh, collaboration happening right now with Welcome Neighbor, um, with House of Goods, and with Oasis International, which is 
um, providing um, uh, furnishings for apartments, such as chairs and sofas and things like that. Um, other things that people can do would be to befriend a newcomer. I mean, if you see if you see a family lost in the grocery store or something, don't hesitate to go up and, 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 and say hello and introduce yourself and see how you can help. That would just be a great thing um, that uh, people would be really, really happy about. Uh, you can donate air, airline miles. One of the things that is uh, uh, happening is that people uh, leave the, the military bases for, um, to come to St. Louis through donated airline miles. You can do that. Um, and then there are also national websites such as Welcome US, um, which tries to pair um, needs of, of, uh, of resettlement agencies with um, uh, items that, uh, that, that uh, people actually have and want to donate. And that's a nationwide thing as is uh, USA Hello. And with that, <laughs> It's a, it's a lot of lot of material, a lot of things that are happening right now. Um, but um, I'd be uh, happy to entertain uh, any questions that might have come in through through the Q and A. Um, uh, so. Yeah, thank you, Paul, so much. Um, that was super informative, and we do have a question um, from a. a, a attendee who did not give their name, but has a good follow-up question, I think, to this idea of ways to help. Um, how do you raise the money that you use to help the, how do you raise the money that you use to help the refugees? So, <clears throat> so refugee programs are really funded through, um, uh, through national sources, through the Office of Refugee Resettlement and through the, and through the State Department. However, it's, um, it's not enough to, um, to cover the costs um, that uh, resettlement uh, actually uh, incurs. So, um, so the, um, the International Institute and other organizations um, go around the community asking for donations. They, um, they submit um, applications to foundations uh, to help them pay for uh, specific programming or to you know, cover the cost of a volunteer coordinator or something like that, that, that these uh, national um, uh, that these federal government programs won't fund. So um, you know, I know you know of the of the of the all the agencies across across Missouri. I know all of them um, participated in Giving Tuesday, for example. They are always uh, looking for ways to um, to um, secure a greater amount of income, not just um, for um, uh, you know for the administration of the program, but predominantly. That, that will go to um, that will go to clients in the form of helping pay rent or utilities, um, you know, buying uh, help, you know, helping with with um, grocery cards uh, to uh, so they can they can go to uh, stores and buy food that's familiar to them and things like that. Great. Um, we have a question from Andrew who asks, "How many refugees have started businesses that have become popular today that you know of?" Oh gosh. Um, well, you, you know, if you take a if you take a, a, a stroll down South Grand, kind of that international district between, um, say, Arsenal and Utah, you'll find any number of, um, of of small businesses that have started by um, by by refugees. Um, if you think about um, uh, Mai Lee over a very popular Vietnamese restaurant, you know, that family came over as a, as a refugee family as well. So there are really longstanding, um, <clears throat> longstanding um, businesses in St. Louis, and there are new businesses that are popping up all the time. Um, some are, you know, we know of uh, uh, several, um, several businesses where uh, women, for example, um, operate out of their homes um, African women who are are um, making uh, making clothing and things like that. Um, it, it's really very inspirational, and then and then sell their sell their items either at markets or online. Um, there is a, a a gentleman, a young man in Springfield, Missouri, who um, is uh, doing a, a home business to um, to design um, uh, to design African clothing. You know that has you know, great colors and patterns and things like that because he missed, 
you know, all of those, uh, you, you know, from his home country and things like that. So um, I, he is a, he's an exceptional young man. And I predict that, that uh, not, that we'll hear, from, hear about him, not only in, in Springfield, but, but across the state and maybe even nationally. Great. Um, some great questions here coming through now. Um, Anna asks, do all of the parolees receive the $1,225 you mentioned, or does the local community have to raise the equivalent for some? So um, yes, each person will will um, will um, receive the twelve twenty five, and you know when I say receive the twelve twenty five, it really they they really probably don't see much of it at all, um, just because it's used for um, for housing and for food and for you know buying bus tickets and things like that. Um, but um, and so it, it's really essential that that we raise additional funds um, for. Um, uh, for them, because that 1225, and that's just a one-time sum. It's not like per month or anything like that. Um, um, is is you know essential for for the long-term um, uh, um, sustainability of of uh, you know our 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 our, our new our new residents in St. Louis. So um, so that 1225 goes goes very very quickly. Um, you know, when you think about how much rent is per month and, and things like that. So, um, so it's really crucial to, to get those extra funds. Yes. And, and a related one, I think from Linda, she writes, I have heard the refugees are to go off financial assistance after three months. True. Is that enough time for them to be on their feet? Um, it is. So the, that, the 1225 is, is, it is expected to last for three months. Um, beyond that, there are other programs. There's um, a federal program called Matching Grant that um, that um, is also uh, a, they get a small weekly cash uh, sum, but it's it's a it's a um, it's an employment program. So the expectation is that they go to they go to work very quickly, and to be in that program, they have to um, uh, they have to commit to not applying for uh, federal benefits such as uh, TANF or refugee cash assistance. So um, for those who are really gung-ho and I wanna work right away, that is a perfect program for them because it does provide them with, with additional cash assistance while they are doing, um, doing their, their job search and things like that. The International Institute's programs, however, um, they, um, they can last for up to five years after a refugee arrives. Um, so some of those programs that I had mentioned, um, uh, refugee social uh, support services and uh, services to older refugees and things like that, um, those are eligible um, to refugees uh, up to that five-year point. The five-year point is important because that is the point where a refugee uh, should be able to um, gain citizenship. So it's a five-year um, five wait until a refugee becomes and become a U.S. citizen. After that five-year point, it's an expectation almost that they become um, that they become citizens, and they wouldn't need to partake in any of those uh, in any of those refugee programs. Okay. Um, two two folks had a very similar question. Blake and Jacob were asking about what area of St. Louis are most of these Afghan refugees settling in. That's a great question too. Um, um, currently, most of the most of these uh, Afghans are being are being put into temporary housing, into uh, extended stay hotels, because we do not have enough housing um, to put them in yet. Um, traditionally, um, we we try to put people into into housing that is located near the International Institute, um, so that they have easy access to English classes, to caseworkers. Um, to social workers and that kind of thing. So, you know, that, that, you know, that South City area um, is really very typical for, for us to put, to, to put folks in. However, as anybody knows, the housing stock in, in St. Louis knows that there are not, um, you know, six bedroom apartments and things like that that we could put a family of 11 in. Um, so some, Sometimes it's very difficult. We put people into, you know, two halves of duplexes and, and, and things like that. We have to follow, um, um, we have to follow city, you know, coding guidelines and not put 
uh, more people into an apartment than, than, um, than the code allows for. So um, although a, a family, I know, I know that there are several families that want to merge their families into one, uh, one house or one apartment and have like 16 people in one house and they don't care that there's only two bedrooms, they can you know, find places around. We cannot put people, we cannot do that on our own. We have to follow those federal guidelines and um, and those those city mandates as far as um, uh, as far as occupancy codes and things like that. This is another question, kind of related to the geography of the region. Richard asks, "Why is it so difficult to involve the Metro East in this effort?" That is a great question too, and I, that's one thing that I would really have. Um, have on my on my to do list is to get um, is to get more involvement in, in the Metro East. The one difficulty that that we have is that um, a lot of these programs that that I was mentioning before are funded through the state, and so to to actually have refugees resettled in Missouri, but then they live in Illinois or they access programs in Illinois, those funds would have to come out of the state of Illinois. And so it becomes a little bit complex, but um, I've been working um, with the state refugee coordinator in both Kansas and in Illinois um, to try to figure out ways that, um, you know, because that's where our two major metro areas are on borders of, of neighboring states, makes us very unique that way. Um, that, uh, that we could get, um, that we can get more, more collaboration going across those, across those borders. You know, and of course, there is no refugee resettlement agency in the Metro East. Um, not that there can't be. I would love to see a, um, a, a an organization decide that, yes, we, we have the, the, the capability of resettling refugees in the Metro East. I think there would be great collaboration between um, the, the, the International Institute on the Missouri side and whatever, um, whatever um, happens on the, on the Illinois side. Um, but you know, there is this, the way things are funded, there is, there is kind of border complications. The great questions keep coming. Um, let's try to get to a few more. Um, Amy asks, do many of the refugees coming to St. Louis speak some English? And if so, how well? There's, there's several parts to the question, so I'll keep reading. Do many of those who do not speak English understand Arabic? Do we have a sufficient number of translators available who speak their languages to meet their needs? Are we facing much of a shortage in English language teachers for the adults in the refugees' families? Wow, Amy, that's a bad <laughs> question. Um, so let's uh, let's unpack it a little bit. Um, you know, people that are coming in speak. Um, uh, you know, it, it runs the gamut. You have people that were uh, translators, interpreters for the United States Army, and they speak English very, very well. Um, the there are some people that don't. They brought. You know, some people, you know, brought their 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 children or grandparents or or spouses uh, with them um, that that don't speak English um, at all or or very well, um, and that's why the International Institute puts such a high um, a high emphasis on adults uh, um, take uh, being enrolled into English as a second language very very quickly. I think that happens the second week that they're there for the kids. Um, they, we have a great relationship with um, St. Louis Public Schools and the uh, Nahid Chapman um, New American Academy, um, which is located on South Grand, which most of the kids will uh, begin attending um, once they're first enrolled in, into school. Um, they, they, provide, um, they provide actual <clears throat> uh, instruction with an ESOL instructor. So things aren't, aren't taught in native language at, at Nehead Chapman. Um, they are taught in, in English, but the, the, the kids are, are, are taught through an ESOL lens. So an English as a second language lens. So they can develop their English language skills um, and with the hope that in a year or two, then they could transfer into a more traditional school um, where they would you know, be in with, with other other kids, native born and foreign born together. Um, and um, um, and um, Kansas City has also just adopted that model. They have a new welcome center um, in Kansas City as part of Kansas City Public Schools. And I'm gonna 
actually be uh, have the opportunity to visit on Thursday, and um, um, and it's it, it's to to you know to provide those kids a base of English language so that they can actually you know go and take history classes and math classes and things like that in traditional schools. What we need, um, uh, oftentimes, the, um, the the kids in uh, in schools, especially in high schools, need a lot of homework help. Um, we have the International Institute, and you can look on the on the website and actually apply to be a, become a volunteer for the um, the after school tutoring program. They need a lot of a uh, lot of folks who will uh, help students with their homework. Um, because they can't do it as fast as um, as uh, many native-born students can, um, and also they're being asked to you know write a paper on you know Revolutionary War history and things like that that are really kind of out of context um, for a, you know a person that arrived into the United States as a 16 or 17 year old, right? So um, so all of those programs are are really important. Um, the the Afghans. Uh, don't tend to speak Arabic. Um, they tend to speak um, uh, Dari and Pashto. Dari is, is essentially a, a form of Farsi, which is spoken in Iran. So uh, it tends to be that, um, that Afghans who speak Dari and Iranians can communicate just very easily together. Um, we utilize a, a variety of, of uh, interpreters. There is, you know, a longstanding um, uh, um, Afghan population here in St. Louis that we can tap into um, to, uh, to provide uh, that interpretation help. But also the Institute also has staff, um, uh, actually a number of staff. I have two of my staff who were, who were Afghans. Um, and um, so we have a number of staff um, at the International Institute who are actually from Afghanistan, who speak the languages that can assist in, in that resettlement process. I don't think I got to all of Amy's, but those are the those pretty are the good. <laughs> good memory. Thank you, Amy, for the great questions. Um, Blake asks, uh, kind of zooming out a bit, how many Afghans are coming to the United States compared to other countries? Do you know? Um, well, I I think that the 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 large the large bulk of them. This is a very difficult question because I don't know how many are actually going to those other countries. But the biggest bulk of them are coming to the United States, and we can we would probably see about ninety thousand when it's all said and done um, uh, come into the United States. Um, you know, through you know from uh, the the time when they were in Kabul through the through the lily pads overseas to um, to the U.S. bases, and then finally to um, to our local communities. Um, I would I would guess that there are probably still going to be Afghans arriving into our local communities through uh, March or April. Um, you know, even though that they want those bases closed by um, mid February, I think that there will still be people coming over from the lily pad sites um, on onto the U.S. bases, and that we'll still be seeing people come in. There's also this also a really interesting um, uh, question, uh, Blake that. You know, there's still people that are leaving Afghanistan, right? There's still people that are finding their way out. Um, the United States has a program called P1 and P2 that will allow for Afghans who find themselves outside of Afghanistan. So now they fit the, the, um, the definition of a refugee because they would be outside of their own country and they'd be in Uzbekistan or, or Pakistan or something like that. Um, and they can apply for P1 or P2. Um, um, the, um, um, and those are for people who, who not only worked with uh, the U.S. military, which those are generally called SIV, special immigrant visas, but those are people who work with for U.S. nonprofits uh, or, or some, other, um, some other American affiliated organization uh, within Afghanistan. So if they can, if they can show that they worked um, for those organizations, they will be uh, provided a P1 or P2 visa. And be allowed to um, uh, and allowed to be uh, resettled in the United States, not as a parolee, but as a, a permanent resident. Okay. It's and then, and sorry, it's hard to know how many of those are. There's probably you know people are leaving all the time, and they're being processed in those in those other countries right now as well. So that program will probably last for for several years. 
Try to we have get a table it. of, of pre-submitted questions also, Paul, and you can see that uh, we have a lively discussion here like the in the previous sessions as well. So uh, that is really, uh, really amazing. And um, one of the questions um, that was floated to us was like, uh, so we're still in the middle of the pandemic. How are you handling COVID and the refugees? And then also in correlation with uh, potential volunteers, uh, what's the system and what, uh, how do you handle everything? Yeah, that's a very good question as well. Um, you know, the, the International Institute is still closed for, um, for um, walk-in clients and for visitors um, due to the pandemic. Um, we have to be very careful on, um, on um, bringing um, people into the, into the, uh, into the agency. Um, the agency itself has a, um, a vaccine mandate, so all staff of the agency have been vaccinated. We have a requirement for our volunteers to be fully vaccinated for COVID. And then all of the Afghans um, that are coming into our communities have been vaccinated when they were on the United States military bases. So there's some sense of, of, uh, of not full sense of safety, but a sense of being uh, um, um, a little more safe. Um, um, but um, yeah, we do have to be careful. I mean, we, you know, there are mask requirements. Um, for um, for all staff and for clients or anybody coming into the building, um, um, we still do social distancing. We still do sanitation. Um, all of those kind of safety mechanisms. Um, we have um, you know when we pick people up at the airport, you know we sanitize. We have these big you know sanitizing sprayer guns and things like that that we sanitize those those vehicles with. So it's providing you know it's not only to uh, uh, providing safety to the clients, but also providing safety to um, uh, to the staff as well. But I have to say, it really made it very difficult because um, anybody that's been to the International Institute before knew they can just kind of walk in, and there was like a million people taking English classes and all these different events happening. Um, and it really seems very strange now that that it's it's very subdued and things like that. Even though in October um, English classes have resumed. Um, but, you know, people are spaced, um, socially distanced, and then they have to uh, maintain their masks and the, and the instructors in a mask that, that whole time as well. Oh, thank you. We have time for just a couple more. Um, Anna asks, refugees are usually on the hook for their plane ticket to the U.S. Will the That's same true. thing... Will the same thing be happening with Afghan SIVs and parolees sent to the air bases or what? No, that's a, that's a very good question. And I'm very happy to say no. Um, the reason is there's an organization called Miles for Migrants that um, has um, scooped up as many um, donated airline miles as, as possible. Um, it's a foundation. Um, and if you have airline miles that you'd like to donate, you can go to Miles for Migrants. Um, and so all of the all of the flights leaving the U, the U.S. bases coming to our local communities are paid for through uh, the generosity of um, donated miles. So you you are correct um, as far as refugees are concerned, they do have to repay that flight coming from um, from uh, overseas into the United States. Um, oftentimes they're very expensive tickets because they're. You know they have to fly from you know remote um, uh, uh, remote airports in um, in Central Africa, for example, trying to get to you know Columbia, Missouri, or something like that. And so you know for a family of of you know ten or something with you know having uh, twelve hundred dollar plane tickets per person, that is quite a large amount of money that they have to pay back to the federal government. But luckily, with um, this Miles for Migrants, um, it, it is not the case. That's good to hear. And uh, one last question, I think, Paul, uh, from Andrew. Um, he asks, when was the most re recent refugee helped by you, and where were they from? Uh, by me personally. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, at, working at the International Institute, it's a daily occurrence. Um, um, you know, I went, um, we had 26, um, 26 people who were uh, initially put it at, into Hollywood Casino uh, out in Maryland Heights. And um, 
they had, they were um, very generous in donating those those rooms to us for, for a short period of time. Um, we then had to uh, move them out into an extended care where they had uh, extended stay, sorry, where they had access to um, to uh, little kitchenettes in their in their um, in their rooms so they can they can cook and things like that. So we had to we had to transfer 26 people, kids and all, from uh, the Hollywood Casino to an extended stay, still out by the airport, uh, but um, you know much more conducive um, environment for them. Um, and uh, and you know there were kids running around and things like that. They were so adorable um, uh, that you know it just kind of you know tears at you what kind of uh, um, experience that they've had to endure over the last um, several months. Not just the you know trying to get over that wall into the Kabul airport, but getting into a cargo plane and flying to somewhere where they didn't know where they were going staying there for quite a long period of time, then flying to a U.S. Army base where, um, where I'm sure, again, they didn't know where they are, but they had to stay in barracks and in tents and things like that. There was no recreational activities available for kids at those bases, um, very little in terms of, uh, of uh, education and, and things like that, only what the volunteers were, would be able to provide. Um, and then they come into, into St. Louis. Unfortunately, you know, the situation is, is that they're in short-term housing again um, until uh, the, the Institute can, can locate uh, more permanent housing with, with them. But, the, you know, you're talking to the kids. And all of them are very hopeful. All of the adults are very hopeful. I mean, it's very difficult for them, too, because they want to be someplace more permanent. Um, but um, but they are um, they are very happy to be um, uh, one is is secure um, that they don't have to feel like they're they're fleeing violence um, that they have that they have um, um, uh, a situation where they can they can kind of relax a little bit because they are in the place that they are going to be for uh, for a longer period of time. It's going to be a difficult ro road for them learning English, um, getting kids enrolled into school, um, trying to find a job. Um, luckily, you know, our, our employment situation in, 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 the, in, in the state is actually very good. And we have a lot of employers asking for, um, for um, uh, new, new, uh, new applicants. So that I think will be, will be a great thing, but um, there's, there's, there's a lot to, that they're gonna have to endure in the future, but you see the perseverance, you know, which is, which is really amazing. You see the resilience um, that many of them have, um, and then you see the hope that they have for, for a brighter future for them and for their kids. Wow, Paul, I love the energy. I, I'm really impressed. I mean, I, we both have known each other for quite a while, but I'm really impressed to see that energy at like 8.30 at night. And after, after lots of weeks of prep for all your refugees under COVID-19 uh, conditions here. Um, so thank you so much for um, your contribution to our speaker series and also to the International Institute uh, that AMSO Global has been partners with for many, many years. We treasure your entire team. We treasure your mission. And uh, on behalf of our AMSO team here, I would just like to say to the audience and to everybody who might be watching this later, uh, thank you for being interested in the world. Thank you for helping our internationals um, arriving here. And um, Paul, if I may um, endorse your uh, warm invitation you have extended earlier to really look up the volunteer opportunities. Uh, and uh, I heard uh, the COVID protocol sounds really sound and good. Uh, so that should not prevent anybody from raising their hands and to pitch in. And I think uh, the spring might be a good time to knock on your doors. So yes. thank you. Over to you, Evie. <laughs> thank you both. And with that, we'll conclude tonight's program. And I wanna thank our speaker again, Paul Costigan for joining us along with all of you. And thank you to the University of Missouri-St. Louis and UMSL Global for another great evening. 
Um, so Global has lots of great events throughout the year. So um, I encourage everyone to consider signing up for the email list. You can go to global.umsl.edu and the sign up link is right there in the first paragraph on that page. Good night, everyone. <laughs>